So the first discussion is uh, Wendy Carlin from uh, UCL London. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to to speak. What I wanted to do was in a, a very kind of varied set of uh, of presentations and papers that lie behind them was really to focus on this core periphery issue in the Eurozone. Um, and I know that uh, Jeff and Wolfgang are going to focus much more on the, the current questions concerning uh, the debt. So what I want to do is to organize my comments around two questions. Um, the first of which is whether the current core periphery problems really have anything much to do with the design and operation of EMU. And then taking a longer term perspective, um, really coming back to the questions that Niels uh, focused on, which was whether EMU was based on a flawed hypothesis that although we more or less all agreed that uh, there wasn't an optimal currency area to begin with, the idea was nevertheless that this would evolve over time. Um, the panel have, I think, presented us very clearly with the two crises that characterize the current situation. A political crisis with widespread discontent uh, documented by Kevin about the euro and increased distrust in the, the, the central institutions, but for very different reasons in the core and the periphery and the economic crisis of which we're all uh, very well aware, um, most important uh, aspect of which I think is probably this issue of the contrast between growth in the core in Germany and recession or even depression in the periphery. So what, I, what was very useful about what Kevin said, I think, was that uh, the EU squandered opportunities for supranational intervention. And this makes a very nice contrast with the discussion at the beginning of the day here, where we were talking about issues at the global level. So in some sense, Europe had the chance to, to deal with this, but didn't, uh, didn't take them. And that this would have met popular demands, uh, both in the core and the periphery. So really taking the banking crisis on head on would have had that character, but that opportunity was, was squandered. And Karl Ludwig, uh, with the historical example that he used, pointed to the fact that the EU failed to lance the boil by refusing to bail out the periphery. Uh, so I think that they've put the finger on an important aspect of the core periphery problem. But we, we've had housing booms, banking crises, sovereign debt problems outside as well as inside EMU. Uh, I think, however, that being inside has, has uh, produced a vulnerability to crisis in interesting ways that were brought up in some of the, pre the presentations, and in particular via a new channel of instability through the effect of the common monetary policy, which fueled the housing and consumption booms, and that was the, the, the private-based vulnerability to the crisis in Spain and Ireland. Uh, on the other side, the, the, the notion of being inside EMU produced this softening of discipline of the real exchange rate channel as lax fiscal policy could not be pu punished in the foreign exchange market and was not punished in the sovereign bond market. And we have questions about um, why that was the case that I, I, th I think we still don't know the answer to. Um, what, what Jean said was that such behavior and the policies that make it, made it possible were fundamentally at odds with Euro participation. So what, what, was, what were the problems that EMU was the solution to? in the core and in the periphery. And maybe this has got slightly forgotten in the, the current debate. I, I think it's important to, to remember that from the perspective of the periphery, it was that EMU provided a nominal anchor for high inflation countries that were unable to deliver credible inflation targeting uh, through monetary policy at the national level. Um, th that was the gain that the periphery would get from Euro membership and it drove political support. Let's think about the other side of the coin, the core. Uh, what EMU did was that uh, it, it was thought of as locking in the benefits of the single European market, to which Neil, Neil's referred, by re ruling out periodic competitive devaluations. Germany, which had nothing to gain from the first, uh, the first part of the story, uh, could gain from the euro, um, that, that was its interest, and although political support was never so enthusiastic, as Kevin pointed out, um, it was nevertheless 
to, to the extent it was, it was part of this story of uh, really cementing the, the single market. So what happened, what t turned out to be the case? Well, I think on, on the one hand, the, the idea that the common currency area would provide the nominal anchor it proved um, un unwarranted um, and that stabilization policy didn't operate in the way that was, it, it was thought it would do inside um, a common currency area. And then on the other side, if we go to the core, uh, Germany has access to coordinated wage setting, so I think institutional differences really matter in the way the common currency area operated. It's true EMU ruled out nominal depreciations in the periphery, but on the other hand, uh, divergences were widened between core and periphery because Germany had access to this alternative mechanism. And I think that's played um, an important part in the establishing the, the vulnerability to the crisis and making more difficult its resolution now. Uh, this is just to, to highlight the fact that if we, if we think about this, how the single monetary policy worked and we just put the output gap on the, the horizontal axis and the deviation of inflation from target on the vertical, we see the reason for a lot of the self-congratulation in the Euro at 10 publications as the Eurozone was right there hitting the target. But on the other hand, all the members of the Eurozone were kind of widely flung about um, and the ones that are in trouble now are very far from the, the sort of bliss point where the Eurozone itself was sitting. And then down there in the southwest corner is Germany, which on average over the whole uh, period up to the crisis had a negative output gap, but even more importantly, inflation below target. So let me, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I will move swiftly on. Uh, so the idea was that the, the periphery countries would get this nominal anchor and the way this was supposed to work was through the, the stabilizing effect of the real exchange rate channel. How did it work? Then it worked, in fact, through the destabilizing uh, operation of the real interest rate channel. This was an incubator of the leverage cycles in, in the Eurozone. It was a shock amplifier in the way that, uh, that uh, Kevin referred to um, in, in those economies. So I think something that was sort of left out of the story in the, in the design uh, that Niels went through was really this issue of stabilization policy in, in the Eurozone, that maybe we can't simply rely on the way the, the real exchange rate channel was supposed to operate, operate, that fiscal policy has to be used in a counter-cyclical way. And there are very interesting comments of all the, the IMF delegations and other delegations visiting Ireland in the period before the crisis congratulating Ireland on the excellence of its fiscal policy, um, where if, if this framework of the, the, the need for stabilization had been firmly in mind, then this would, would certainly not have, have been the case. But this is a difficult problem to solve. Okay? It's harder to delegate policy to an independent uh, fiscal council, and even if you have a sophisticated independent fiscal policy council, you've got a trickier problem in terms of uh, dealing with stabilization problems than is the case uh, with the floating exchange rate. So these issues have come to the fore. The, the question of endogeneity, okay, so we didn't start with, with countries that really fitted together as had been imagined, um, at least in the con concept of an optimal currency area, but still there was this notion of uh, of mechanisms that would bring the thing into being over time. The economic me mechanism operating through the discipline of the single currency that was supposed to prom uh, promote supply-side reform. And the political mechanism that deep economic integration would produce support for greater political integration. But uh, as has been pointed out very clearly, I think, by Kevin and Jean, this uh, is, is not what happened. Let me pose a question that came up in the, the first session of the day today, but also touches uh, very closely on the, the, the discussion uh, that Dahlia Marine was um, involved in yesterday. 
The question I really want to pose to, to, the, to the panel members is why is living in a common currency area with Germany so difficult? And it, it has a kind of echo in terms of the global uh, imbalances that, that were being discussed, uh, that were being discussed um, in the first session today. Okay, so Germany has a deeply rooted export-led growth model. We know that relative in, in inflation persistence matters. I showed you, you the pictures. Uh, and we know that, meanwhile, during the, the, the first decade of the Eurozone, there's been a massive restructuring of German companies' activities, and they've taken advantage of new sites for production in Eastern Europe. This seems to have passed the southern periphery by, which was uh, just referred to by Niels. And just to leave you with a picture, if we need to have nominal uh, wage restraint in, in, the, in the periphery, we also need to have faster productivity growth, but it's been a very long time since the countries in the southern periphery have experienced more rapid productivity growth than the core. Okay, it finished in, in 1980. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne.